For those of you who don't know me, I'm Greg Kimball. I'm the Director of Public Services and Outreach here at the Library of Virginia. And I want to welcome all of you. It's been a while since we've done many live events, so I'm glad to see you all here today. Um, I'm just going to briefly introduce our speaker and, of course, our fellow from the Virginia Humanities. And uh, that's another thing that got suspended with COVID <laughs> for a number, almost two years. So we we're very delighted this fall to welcome all four, and I think eventually five in the next summer, of the uh, Virginia Humanities Fellows who are working here at the library. It's really always exciting to have them here, um, interacting with the staff and just learning about how they, their process of doing research and going through the collections. So, uh, Dr. Lois Levine earned degrees in history and literature from Harvard University, the University, University of Southern California, and UCLA. She's a former faculty member at UCLA and Reed College, and she's now a public humanities scholar leading programs at museums, libraries, humanities organizations, K-12 schools, and universities. Her writing about race, history, and American culture, you, many of you probably have seen in have appeared in the Atlantic, New York Times, and the Los Angeles Review of Books, and similar outlets, as well as scholarly journals and academic books. Uh, several of her articles um, and chapters are now included in textbooks, and her work in medical humanities is taught in medical schools. Very interesting background. She's also proud to have published in the vital field of critical race theory. Dr. Levine is an award-winning poet and novelist, one of her poems is inscribed on a hospital wall. Author of two novels, Juliet's Nurse, imagines the 14 years leading up to the events in Romeo and Juliet from the perspective of one of William Shakespeare's most comic, tragic, and body female characters. Having turned a footnote from her dissertation into the novel The Secrets of Mary Bowser in 2012, she's now researching the first scholarly biography of the real figure behind the Mary Bowser myth. And that's the project that brought her here to the library and to Richmond this fall. Um, as she concludes her time at Virginia Humanities uh, and with the LVA, she's going to be also doing a Mellon Fellow at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. And after a brief return home to Portland, Oregon, uh, she'll be coming back to uh, DC for the inaugural, to be the inaugural Cokie Roberts Fellow at the National Archives. So, uh, Dr. Levine. I've discovered it's the Cokie Roberts part that gets the audience excited. <laughs> it tells you what tote bag crowd you're in. Um, thanks everybody for coming today and I really do wanna thank Virginia Humanities Council for funding these fellowships. They are vital to our work. And everybody here at the Library of Virginia for being incredibly welcoming and incredibly helpful during a time when I feel like I have to suck all of the knowledge out of this building into me before I go back home. Um, and I live in Portland, Oregon, and that's a place where we've really developed a, a practice to acknowledge the land on which we live and work. So I'm gonna begin with a land acknowledgement. And I think these are not as common here in Virginia, but I hope that will change. So today, we gather on Powhatan lands, traditionally stewarded by those who identify now and in centuries past as Monacan, Mataponi, Upper Mataponi, Chickahominy, Eastern Chickahominy, and Pamunkey people. Let us bring our collective attention to Richmond, Virginia's ongoing debt to the indigenous people present and past of these nations. The displacement of native people from these lands was inextricably linked to the enslavement of Africans and their descendants, all enacted to create white wealth and power. Land acknowledgments like this are intended to remind us of the need to take action now and in the future to address these past and ongoing displacements and disparities. So as you can guess, I'm somebody who thinks about history a lot, not just when I'm doing research or writing or giving a talk, but when I'm cooking dinner or watching a movie or riding my bike around town. And when I think about history, I think not just about what we know about the past, but how we know it. And that's really what I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, so here are a couple of little historical quotes. Uh, how many of you have heard of Ralph Waldo Emerson? Well, pretty much everybody. How many of you have heard of Mariah Stewart? I saw like half a hand up. All right. You can, you can find the historian in the room. Um, Mariah Stewart was a 
African-American woman who was a political writer and speaker. As you can see, she was roughly contemporaneous with Ralph Waldo Emerson. It's not surprising that history has made one of them more well-known to us than the other, but I urge you to learn more about her. And I have these quotes up for a couple of reasons. Emerson says, if the whole of history is in one man, it is all to be explained from individual experience. Each new fact in his private experience flashes a light on what great bodies of men have done, and the crises of his life refer to national crises. This is Emerson in a nutshell, right? He wrote an essay called Self-Reliance. He believes in the individual and what the individual does. Mariah Stewart says, who shall go forward and take off the reproach that is cast upon the people of color? Shall it be a woman? She's thinking about a different kind of identity. And I wanted to share these just to introduce the, comment, the concepts of normativity and specificity. So normativity, this is a word that I learned in graduate school. It's one of my favorite words. I feel like we don't use it enough or remember it enough these days. But it means when people take their experience and they assume that it is the universal experience, right? You can see it's like the word creativity, but we took the crea, the creative part off and added normal, like I normalize my experience as though it's everybody's experience. Um, and that's what Emerson is up to, right? He says, one man, and that one man stands for everyone. And even though he doesn't say white man, he's assuming that too. So he's assuming his experience as a white man is the universal experience. On the other hand, Mariah Stewart gives us some specificity, right? She's thinking about how race shapes people's experience. She's thinking about how gender shapes people's experience. And she's thinking about the fact that to be a black woman who is an activist, who is a maker of history, is, requires fundamentally different things than what Emerson is thinking about. Now, I also put these here because these happen to be the epigrams that I used in my first book, which, as Greg told you, is the novel, The Secrets of Mary Bowser. I'm not going to talk a lot about the novel. It's fantastic. If you're looking for uh, gifts for people this holiday season, I urge you to give The Secrets of Mary Bowser. Uh, it's timeless or timely, whichever way you want to put it. I will say that this novel came out of the fact that when I was finishing graduate school, I heard probably what you all have heard, the basic myth of Mary Bowser, a black woman who was born into slavery and ended up becoming a spy for the Union during the Civil War by posing as a slave in the Confederate White House. And I took that idea and I ran with it. And I, as a novelist gets to do, made up what I couldn't find in the archives. And I changed what was inconvenient for the telling of a story. Because in a novel, you need a character arc and a story arc. And that means that you dispense with things that are inconvenient and incorporate things that might not have been true, but is convenient. It's all historically plausible, but it's not true. But one of the things that I had to do in writing this novel. It is written from the point of view of Mary. It means I had to think about everything that was happening from the perspective of somebody who was black and female and also quite young. And it also means that the people who read this book are experiencing slavery, freedom, political activism, the Civil War from the perspective of somebody who is black and female and also fairly young. So it taught me good skills that I can now use as I take on this new project of not making the stuff up, not throwing out what's inconvenient, but, but being in the mess of what we can document and how do we interpret it as I write a biography of black activism in, the 19th, in 19th century America. Same figure, totally different project. What do I mean by this phrase? Well. Here are some examples of recent wonderful books that are biographies. Um, Sojourner Truths, uh, Sojourner Truth, A Life, a Symbol by Nell Irvin Painter. Uh, Dr. Painter is working with this idea that Sojourner Truth has been a symbol. She is somebody who's remembered in ways that both honor and distort the realities of her life. So that's what this book was doing, was to sort of address that difference. Um, and then a, a more recent book, Caleb McDaniel's uh, book, Sweet Taste of Liberty, which is about Henrietta Wood. And this is piecing together from fragments in the historical record to try and construct the life of somebody that nobody had really paid much historical attention to, even though she's a fascinating and important figure. What I'm doing is sort of in between these two things, because there's the myth of Mary Bowser, and I have to uh, in 
engage with correcting that myth, which keeps growing. New, incredibly untrue things start to circulate as uh, claims to be fact about her all the time. But I'm also having to piece together the scant traces that appear in the historical record, although the more I look, the more I find about her and the people she interacted with. Um, so I'm trying to be a good biographer as a repentant novelist and get it right. However, I am also in some ways a bad biographer because biographers tend to focus on the exceptionalism of their subjects. And I'm less interested in that in working on this project because my goal is to help audiences understand the breadth of 19th century African-American activism in terms of the countless black people who not only actively worked to end slavery, but who before, during, and after the Civil War were activists for racial justice, working to achieve full citizenship for African Americans. So if you left the book that I'm working on now and you only knew about one person, I will have failed in this goal. I want you to appreciate that she was part of networks of activists and to understand that this is a history that is not done with the writing of one book, but should in, encourage us, as with Mariah Stewart, to learn more about these people that we don't know enough about. So this requires a lot of archival research, um, including things that are not directly about the person that I'm writing about, but to give me context. And most of often, archives are like Ralph Waldo Emerson. They presume things about whose stories are to be told. Um, they do not have the perspective of people who are people of color, of women, of children, of people with disabilities, and particularly of people who are in more than one of those categories. Most archives in the United States and the Library of Virginia is definitely in this category, center whiteness. It means that much of what is preserved in these archives was created by white people, for white people, but more than that, it was created with a presumption that whiteness was normative and that preserving white perspectives was the goal. So one challenge for me, and this is true for many other researchers, including my fellow fellows whose talks will be coming up in the coming weeks and months, is to figure out how we work with what is in these archives in order to tell stories that center the perspectives of African Americans, and particularly in this case, an African American woman. So that's what we're really going to be doing here today. All right, get ready. This is the sort of thing that when you are a historian, you look at all the time. Um, it's a primary source, and it's meant to help us understand history. So I'm going to ask you, and feel free to move up if you're in the back, because there's going to be a lot of this going on in the rest of the talk. Um, put on your historian's thinking cap and maybe your historian's uh, eyeglasses as well, and have a look. Can you make out any of what this says? And if not, it's a good time to move forward. It's a good, everybody's masked. All right, on this one, because it's the first one, I'll help you out a little bit. But after this, training wheels are coming off. June 29th, 1865, written from Norfolk, to Colonel O. Brown, the Assistant Commissioner for Virginia. White boys beat and cruelly injured female scholars of colored schools. Mayor Tabb refused to hear the testimony of teachers because they are colored. They applied to him for redress before consulting me. What actions shall I take? I could not wait to transmit through regular channel. John H. Keatley. OK, I helped you out by telling you what it said. But now you tell me, what does it mean? How, as a historian, could you use this document to understand the past? And I'm a teacher. I'll wait up here in silence to one of you volunteers. And there are microphones so that you don't feel like you need to shout. Does Mr. Tab take the city like OK, so you want to already go bigger and find the context for it, which is definitely useful. And you said, look for Tab's papers, because he's the mayor, so his stuff is more likely to be preserved. But what can we pull out just of this particular document? What do you learn? Who's the they? They were vocal, the black, the female scholars of the colored school, the black women. 
Yeah, and there's somebody else back there wanting to jump in? Right. Right, so there's, this is, it's military communication, but it's about a very civilian incident. We know a little bit about these girls. What, what does it actually tell us? It tells us, first of all, that John Keatley feels like he's got to ask permission from Colonel Brown about what to do next, right? He feels urgency to do it. I could not wait for normal channels. Um, but it also tells us that Mayor Tobb is not particularly helpful in this situation. What does it tell us about the perspective? If you had to fill in the imaginary thought bubble over the black people involved in this incident, what's in that thought bubble? How far the chain do we have to go? Right. Like one of the most important things, it's unfortunate that Mayor Tobb didn't do what he should have done, but it tells us, and in fact, uh, in writing this letter, Keatley is very clear to inform us. First, they went to the mayor. They didn't get what they needed from the mayor. So then they went to me. These are persistent people who know that they need to have redress. What do we know about the girls in this school and their families? They value education, right? Their children are being harassed on the way to school, but they see that they need education. And Norfolk, during the Civil War, opened schools for black people while there were not free public schools for white people. It was harder to convince the white people to send their kids to school than the black people to send their kids to school, right? So when I look at a document like this, it's communication from one white guy in the military to another white guy in the military. But as I read it, I'm looking to see what it can tell me about those individuals who care enough about school to go or to send their children, who care enough about the safety of those children to go complain, and when the mayor doesn't do what he's supposed to do, to find somebody else who will listen. And you can imagine Keatley now saying, I know I need to do something. They are going to persist. They are going to make me pay attention. Tell me what I'm supposed to do. It's June of 1865. We are barely out of the Civil War. So figuring out what role the federal military has in ensuring the safety and access to education, those are parts of what we mean when we say full citizenship, of the newly emancipated. And some of these folks may have not been newly emancipated. They might have been free for years, but still subject to this kind of racist violence. OK, so that's a document. But historians don't just look at documents. We also need an interpretive framework. Um, and this is a wonderful book by Kadata Williams uh, called They Left Great Marks on Me. African-American Testimonies of Racial Violence from the Civil War to World War I. And Kadata combed through archives to find all of these examples. And in analyzing them, her book demonstrates that speaking out against racial violence the way that those teachers in the telegram did was itself a political act. And this interpretive framework that she puts out is really helpful to me. I remember it every time I'm looking at something like that telegram. It's telling me, what should I be looking for? Where is black agency? Even in a document created by white people, for white people, about the bad behavior of white people. How do I find that agency? Um, I will also say, for those of you who enjoy a podcast, Kadata Williams was the writer and host of the podcast Seizing Freedom, which Virginia Public Media produced last February. It always happens in February. Um, and if you haven't listened to it, it's quite fantastic. I cannot recommend it highly enough. Um, so I'm going to take you to another document. And this one might be a little easier to read. Many of the documents I've been looking at here at the Library of Virginia are very mundane examples of the many ways that full citizenship was denied to free blacks as well as to enslaved people. So this is a government form. Uh, it is a register for free Negroes, meaning people who were not enslaved in the period when slavery was still the, um, operating here in Virginia. So if we look at this document, what does it tell us? Richard Adams uh, or Abrams. Uh, 
Right, so the laws in, the, in Virginia change over time, and if you are uh, born to a family that had been a free black family for generations prior to the passage of a particular law, you have a right to stay that is different than the right of people who are born to a mother who was emancipated after that law, right? So the status of his mother is important. We also know his name, by the way, it's Richard Abrams. What else do we learn from this? My fellow fellows, you can speak up. And one just above his left thumb. Why does a government form want to know this? Right. This pass is a precious thing. This register is a precious thing. And they want to make sure they can attach it to the right person. Um, from the perspective of somebody who's interested in centering Richard Abrams' experience, how is that information useful? Yeah, I mean, it, it tells us who he is. It gives us a way to look at him. We have his age, which can help us find him in other records if we're looking for him. Um, and often, these are the dis physical descriptions that we have of people come from documents that were not intended to celebrate their lives, but to constrain them. And yet, these documents give us insight into their lives that we wouldn't otherwise have. Yes. It's a given that you aren't going to know a free person's birthday. Right, exactly. That's a, a, one of the things that's really interesting to me is what's printed on the form. What does the form assume is going to be standardly true for any black person the form is then encountering, or who is encountering the form? And that is one of those things. Um, what's important to the government and what the government presumes about people's identities. Right, and if you know the history, you know that if you were a free black person in one county in Virginia, or one city in Virginia, and you wanted to move to another one, you had to get the particular permission of that place to move. So these are documents that are not just, that are intended to remind free black people that they, are, they do not move around in the same way that white people do. You might be free, but again, this is the difference between freedom and full citizenship, that your movements are regulated, that somebody can demand to see proof of your freedom, where a white person doesn't have to encounter that kind of legal harassment and potentially jailing and fining if they can't produce documentation. I looked at a lot of these documents and other documents like this, because sometimes what you have is not the official register, but just a slip of paper. And I'm telling you, it's like torn off lined paper that will just say so-and-so is free, signed by a white person. And as you're going through the archives thinking, oh, my time here is almost up, I gotta get through all of these documents, it's easy to start looking at them a little too quickly. And I had to consciously make myself stop and say, each one of these documents was precious to people. It was huge for the person who had this document and for everybody who cared about it. And I had to slow myself down. But I also wanted to think back to Kadada Williams' book where she says, those testimonies of racial violence don't just tell us that black people were done to. They tell us that black people were doers, that they were actively asserting a political identity in lodging these complaints against the violence. Well, that made me think, what do I need to think about these free registers, in what way totally meant to restrict and harass free black people? Can I read this differently, thinking through the lens that Kadada Williams has kindly offered me? And I realized this is also a political document. This is somebody, it is clear that Virginia does not want Richard Abrams or other free black people here. And yet, Richard Abrams is saying, I have a right to be here. I have kin here, I have community here, I matter to them and they matter to me, 
and I am asserting my right to be here. You can harass me, and I can't change that, but I am not going to give in to it. I am asserting my right as a Virginian to be here. And so I really came to feel, it's like those, um, uh, what are they called? The thing where you look at the picture and you can see the two faces or the vase, you know the thing I mean, right? Do I look at this and see only the oppression or can I also see the assertion of political selfhood? Now, I actually only showed you this one because I really wanted to show you the next one, which is a little bit more complicated. So you might have to turn your head a little bit. Can you make out any of the writing on this pass? The up-down writing. This register is canceled by the death of Peggy Roberts, right? So it's been issued to somebody, and then she's died. Oh, man, when I saw this, I thought, oh, as an eighth grader in my life taught me to say, dang, dang. I wanted to believe that if Peggy Roberts was gone from this world and didn't need this register, maybe somebody else could make use of it. Maybe some enslaved person could slip into her identity long enough to use this to seize their freedom too. But then I remembered that I want to think about other ways to read these documents, not just in terms of oppression, not just in terms of disappointment. So I worked really hard on this one to figure out how to read it. And as I thought about it, I realized how many of you have done genealogical research, either on your own family or other folks in history? So lots of, not a surprise that you turned out, right? You know that when you're looking at folks in the 19th century, even white people, not just black folks, often we don't know exactly when people were born or when they died, right? So one thing this gives us is, again, that same description of who Peggy Roberts was. We can estimate her age of, uh, her year of birth. We can understand what she looked like physically, but we also know definitively when she died. And for the people today who might be looking for Peggy Roberts, that's really important and precious information. So again, even though I'm rushing through thinking, this isn't, I'm not looking for Peggy Roberts, I stop and I pause and I just try and honor the fact that Peggy Roberts was a person. She was a Virginian. She had people she loved who loved her, and this document mattered in that context. And here, again, I think about the other historians whose work informs my reading of documents like this. Uh, this book, The Price for Their Pound of Flesh, The Value of the Enslaved from Womb to Grave in the Building of a Nation, is by Dana Ramey Barry. It is a work of economic history. If you had told me, Lois, you are going to be so fascinated by a work of economic history that you're going to tell other people how wonderful it is, I would have said, I'm sorry, you have the wrong Lois Levine. I'm not interested in economic history. I'm interested in social history. I care about the people. But once again, the more you read, the more you learn that you didn't know. And I learned how important a book like this is. As the title suggests, Barry looks at how profit was made off of enslaved bodies even before they were born, until after the people died. But she's not just looking at the prices that were paid when enslaved humans were bought and sold or rented out, as often happened in the state of Virginia. She wasn't just looking at the money that made by enslavers who exploited the labor of these people or who insured or mortgaged or otherwise exploited the economic value of human property. Because one of the things she talks about, although she documents all of that in this book very thoroughly, using incredibly, again, those sources made by white people for white people to represent a white, white interests and perspectives, she also talks about soul value, the value that enslaved people had for themselves and for the people who loved them, right? So when I'm looking at that Peggy, uh, Peggy Roberts register and I see that she's died, I have to think about it in terms of the soul value. She was not an enslaved person, she was a free person, but that concept of soul value is something that I carry with me. Um, so I hope you're getting my big idea here, which is the boring way we were all taught history once upon a time in some classroom where you might have yawned, was about factoids, like you had to memorize dates and names, maybe some numbers. And I'm not very interested in the factoids of history. I'm interested in the frameworks that we use to understand the past. 
um, and that it's those frameworks that really help us read documents like this and that has been driving the work that I've been doing here and at other archives. So there's one more document for us to look at together. And you guys, you got to have to help me here. So get ready. I'm going to give you particular assignments. I know, it's not easy to read. I totally urge you to move forward. But before you do, let's say this. Uh, everybody from person in charming red plaid hat, can you raise your hand for a sec? Thank you. OK, so everybody on that side of the room, from charming hat over this page, you all can be on this page. And if you're sitting towards the front of the room, go for the bottom part of the page. If you're sitting towards the back of the room, go to the top part of the page. Take a few moments. I didn't just transcribe it. You're going to have to do the work. And again, you can get up and move around. Um, what are some of the things that strike you about what you're reading? And this is a passage from the minute books of Ebenezer Baptist Church right here in Richmond. Um, the church was created out of First African Baptist Church, and it held its first services in 1858. But I'm going to step back and let you squint and read and try and figure some things out. All right, I'm hearing some murmuring. What are some of the things that folks are noticing? And you could have declarations, and you can have questions, and you don't have to have made out every word in your section, but what are you noticing? Um, a balance of, is that $7? Where, where are you? Yes. Oh, the poor saints. The treasury of the poor saints was received, showing balance in hand to be $7.85. OK. Brilliant thing to notice. Any idea what it might mean? Collection for foreign members of the congregation? Yeah, so this is a congregation. Uh, everybody is black. There's a white minister who's in charge of this congregation in, to be in accord with both the laws of uh, local and state laws as well as the preference of the Baptist organization. But otherwise, the members of, these church, of this church are black, and they are free and enslaved people. They are taking up a collection to help people in need, the Poor Saints Fund. This is really fascinating information that people who are as much as one can be on the economic margins. Now, some of the free black members might have had decent incomes. They probably didn't have tremendous incomes. But even enslaved people with access to money were taking up collections that this idea of mutual aid was ingrained in the community and that you took care of each other in ways that were emotional and social and religious, but also economic. So thank you for starting us there. What else are things folks noticed in the document? Yeah. Yes. So what do you want to tell us about that? Any, any ideas? So 
So received by letter, for those of you who don't do church history, which again, like economic history, I didn't think was gonna be something I did, but turns out your interests take you where they take you, means that the congregation, in order to come into this congregation, you had to be <clears throat> approved in terms of your spiritual life. So received by letter means that she's come from another congregation and that that congregation has said, don't worry, Eliza Price, good Christian, might have included information about her baptism in that previous congregation or other parts of her spiritual life, um, but she's free, and that's noted here. Did anybody come across somebody who wasn't free in the sections you were looking at? Yeah. All right, hold off on the juiciness. Louisa Hatchet owned by Mr. Harvey. So what do we make of this little factoid that we need to put into an interpretive framework in the minute book? For one thing, it tells us that the minute books were required to note who was free versus who was enslaved. And the larger implication was that you could only participate in this church if your enslaver allowed you to participate in this church, right? So Eliza Price doesn't have to worry about this, but Louisa Hatchett knows that her practice of her religion is dependent on the permission of her enslaver. But there's something else, and that's, this is actually a, a pertinent example here about these names. Perhaps often the enslaved people don't have the same last name as the enslaver. That does happen, but what's been remarkable to me looking at records like this and many others is how often that is not the case here. That there may be names that you know as the names of, oh, those people were enslavers, but these enslaved people in that household actually have different names. Huh. What do I do with that information? Well, it makes me realize that the same way that white people pass on surnames from one generation to another to say, you are my kin, we are attached to each other, enslaved people did that too. So we don't know where Louisa Hatchett got the last name Hatchett, but we know that it is part of her identity and she retains that as important to her, despite the fact that somebody named Mr. Harvey claims her as his legal property, right? So even just that little piece, this document wants to do the work of controlling black people. It wants to say, you can only be in the church if your white enslaver allows you. But I look at it and I can see something about Louisa Hatchett that that kind of white supremacist world didn't want me to see, which is her asserting her claim to kin, whoever the Hatchets are to her. Now, you started to say this was the juicy section. Tell us more. Yeah. Uh, in that section, there are people being excluded from the church, uh, one for contempt of the church and two for fornication. Mm, OK. I knew somebody would recognize the word fornication. It's not why I chose this particular page, but I knew we would get there. What, as historians, do we make of this fact? The, not in the law. Right, so the, there's this idea of how you comport yourself, right? It, what's weird to me, I wrote this novel and I made all this stuff up and then I hear lines from the novel as I'm looking at documents, right? And there's a point in the novel, in my very invented scene in which I know who Mary's mother is and they're having a conversation, in which Mary's mother says to her at some point, those are white people's rules, we live by Jesus's rules but we have to live by the rules that white people make for us too, right? And then I see this and I think, ah, this is what I was trying to get at, that there are all these laws restricting the behavior both of free and enslaved black people, but there's also this community organization of the church, and it is saying, well, to be a member of our community, you have to comport yourself in a particular way. Now, it also tells us as is always the case when people break rules, that they're not doing what everybody else says that they could, right? Somebody is enjoying some sex that other people think they shouldn't be enjoying, and that is not a shock, because it has happened through all of human history. Um, but it lets us know that, too, that this person is willing to pursue a relationship that is meaningful to them, even though they might face the censure of their church. 
Um, and what was our other, uh, oh, for contempt of the church in not appearing when notified to do so. Okay, did you catch that? That that's what that says. For con this person, John Hicks, was excluded for not paying a just account and for contempt of the church in not appearing when notified to do so. What does that mean? The church, and this is black deacons running the show, has its own system of justice, right? They say, we are concerned about your behavior. You can come. We've done, as some of you might have seen in other places, there are people under investigation, right? Up in the upper right corner. Sorry, I'm going to peer at my screen. The committee in the case of Brother Garnet was continued, and Brother... I can't read it um, with these glasses. Added to the committee, committee was appointed to wait on Brother Braxton for contempt of the church, right? So they have a committee. They're appointing people. Again, no access to the legal system in, uh, except to be the you know, actual legal system of the city or the state, except to be prosecuted. But they've created their own system in which people get investigated, sometimes they get exonerated. Some of our friends who might have been excluded from the church will appeal and come back into the church in a later page. It's fun to watch those people. Um, it turns out that they weren't really fornicating. It turns out that this or that. Um, but that there is, even in a moment when there is such a huge restriction on full citizenship, the practices of self-governance, the practices of uh, social mores are part of what it means to be living your full life as a black person and exerting your personhood here in Richmond. Are there other juicy things that we missed off of this? One of the things that I noticed, um, and you guys hit on a lot of them, so I don't mean to say that you came up short. Uh, one of the things I noticed is that they also record deaths, right? Uh, in the upper left, the death of Brother Robert Holmes was reported, right? And again, there's another report of the Poor Saints Committee. Actually, we can see that the Poor Saints Committee went in May from $3.81 to $7.85 by the end of September, so they've had a good fundraising season. Um, but the death of Brother Robert Holmes. So again, this is one of those places where if you're trying to find particular people, the church cared. Their brethren and sistren, is that the right word? In the church cared about each of these people as humans and recorded their deaths because it was a loss to the community. And that is a gain to us as historians, not just because it tells us this is about when this person died, but this is a person who was loved and cared for in their community. And there's one other thing, and it's the reason I chose this particular page, not for the fornication, that it took me a, a long moment to realize about this particular page. And it's not what's there. It's what's not there. What's the very first date on this page? Can anybody make it out? Go up a bit. May 12th is there, but go up a bit. April 1861, received on the fourth Sunday from, uh, I can't make out that church, uh, Middlesex. Boy, I'm really not getting it today. Um, so these are people who have transferred in from another church, and their owner is listed there. So they may have just moved from another location, and they've transferred into the church. And in this instance, the last names, again, are different between the enslaver and the enslaved. But I, that's not what was so interesting to me about that date. What's so interesting about that date? Yeah, April 1861. Is there anything else going on in Richmond, Virginia in April of 1861? I am so fascinated by the fact that, and I read all of the records for this church, um, and you can read them for this church and also for First African Baptist Church. Those are the ones that are here. Uh, if you are having so much fun that you can't tear yourself away, the microfilm machines await you. Um, 
there's not any reference to the war in the minute books of the church. Even when the war ends, there is not really, there are sort of these passive references. It says something about like the deed for the land that the church was on was transferred to the deacons of the church, meaning it no longer had to be held by a white person. A black person could hold that property. They refer to a new um, a minister being hired to oversee the church. They don't mention we don't have to have a white minister anymore. That law is done for, so we can just choose our minister. Not mentioned. Only through context do I uh, perceive that. As historians, what do we do with that fact? What does it mean that for the people in this church, talking about the war wasn't something that happened in this minute book? And I do not have the textbook with the answers at the back, the teacher's version of the textbook with the answers at the back. So I ask you that question because it's one that I'm puzzling on. What do you think? Yeah. Perhaps it was an intentional omission because of the risk that might be introduced if, say, someone's reviewing these minute books and they're inserting dissension or what have you. OK, yeah, that's, I, I'm going to circle back to that. Um, are there any other thoughts about why it might not be there? Yeah. I should note something about the issues with involvement in the war on race and class discrimination. I'm not quite getting what you mean, Alan. Being a black church, um, like, could they try to have multiple unions at the time just because of that? Like, Right. Or at least it didn't affect their spiritual life. Now, we don't know what they were praying for on Sunday. We might hazard a few guesses about what they'd be praying for on a given Sunday, but we don't know. But for them, the world of my religious community is preserved in these books, and that's the world that's preserved in these books. And I'm going to circle back to what you said earlier, but somebody else is waiting. So again, sort of thinking about the difference between the, the religious world that I'm in and the military political world and the black world that I'm in and the white world outside. Yeah. Mil it was and wasn't a white people's war. Black people understood that the Civil War was a freedom war long before Abraham Lincoln did. Part of the way that they knew that, actually, was that they could see how it freaked out their enslavers were. Before the war started, enslavers were saying, this Lincoln's going to free our slaves. And black people were like, pardon me, I, I hear that. <laughs> they made that more true than Lincoln knew it was going to be. Were you going to? Right, so again, a refuge, a religious space, a black space, something separate from. Although I want to circle back to that first comment about, well, they also may have understood that these records would, were periodically examined. They were subject to examination by the deacons of the white church that sponsored the black church. And you had to have that sponsorship. So you also did not put anything too terribly radical in these minutes. Now. Ebenezer Baptist Church doesn't get written about nearly as much as First African Baptist Church does. In First African Baptist Church, there was a white minister as well, Robert Ryland. And one of the things that happened along the way is it turns out that people who had stolen themselves free and were members of that church would write back to other black members of the church and tell them where they were and how they were doing and maybe how they got to be where they were. And at some point, those letters were intercepted. And we know this, we know about this process because they were intercepted. And Robert Ryland is accused basically of aiding and abetting the uh, self-emancipation of enslaved people. Robert Ryland is a complicated character. He's pro-slavery, but he cares about black people's souls. He is not the only character who's complicated in that way. But he ends up writing something in a, essentially a national Baptist publication to defend himself against those charges. And it's 
that article, it's actually a series of four articles, it's so long they put it in four different issues, that tell us a lot of what we know beyond the minute books of the church. We don't know whether people at Ebenezer Baptist Church were also communicating across the line from having stolen themselves free back to people who were still enslaved, sharing information, sharing good tidings, because nobody got caught. And as a historian, you want the documentation, but as a human being, I'm like, I hope that they were, and we just don't know it because they didn't get caught. I hope this was a freedom train for as many people as possible. But I think it brings us back to that comment that you put out there about, again, we have to realize that this document was still a document not quite created by white people for white people the way, for example, those registers of free Negroes were, but still subject to white authority. And so when we work with them, we have to keep that in mind as we're thinking about how to use them. I've talked for a long time. I think there's probably supposed to be Q&A. Uh, any more thoughts on this? Any, any cues that I can A, and there are microphones here, and lovely assistants. I told them I would call them both Vanna White. Uh, if you would like, uh, to ask a question or make a comment, either about this or any part of the talk, or really anything, because I just love talking. What have we got? OK, so I see one, two, three. Um, thanks, Dr. Levine, for a very stimulating discussion. I was wondering, you know, in, through these archives, if you're finding individuals, I mean, even though the focus is on the broader kind of communities, individuals who seem to like reoccur that you know, could be the subject of upcoming historical fictions or biographies or that sort of thing. I mean, you know, folks that, that are, are maybe appearing in different books as well and uh, that sort of thing. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, it, I'm writing a story in which many of the main characters have names like Mary and Elizabeth. We were talking about this last night or yesterday at lunch that um, you, you like the people with unusual names because you can always tell that's the same person, right? Like this John Adams is not the one who was president of the United States. This John Brown is not the one who tried to lead an insurrection. Um, but when you can trace people over time, absolutely. That to me, the point again is not one person, one story to be told, but the richness, whether it is fiction, a route I've gone in the past, or nonfiction biography, which is what I'm writing now, the more time I spend in records like this, the more I think there is so much to understand in so many ways that we have not yet connected these records, right? What could, could we take those registers and put them beside the minute books of the church? What would we learn looking at those things? How do we see things? And I had this experience the other day. There's a family, a free black family who are persons of interest in my investigation, we'll call them. They're very tangential to the story I'm telling, but they're interesting, and so I keep looking for them. And I thought I had found them in all the places I might find them, and then I was reading a book by a historian who was on a Virginia Humanities grant and did research at the Library of Virginia, and this person was giving six examples in a paragraph about the way that um, free black families were often uh, prosecuted as whole groups of people. And lo and behold, this family that I was interested in was listed there. And again, because their name is a little bit unusual, I was like, huh, there they are. And I went and found information about that case that I wouldn't have found otherwise. So I think the more people who do this work, the more we're going to see how much of this work need, still needs to be done, if that gets at your question. You may have already mentioned this. I'm not sure. But did you use the uh, 1860 slave schedule to help you identify some of these people? Yeah. So and the, the other, so the, other uh, census schedules, too. The census records are really uh, useful up to a point. And, and at different points, they give us different information. So in 1850 and 1860, there are slave census records. They give us broad outlines of information because we get gender and age, and age even in a category. Um, so we don't necessarily get the level of detail that we would want, and it's really hard to tell where somebody goes from one census to another. Again, even if you've been researching your own family members, black or white, free or enslaved, you know this. But the more of that, the better. And digitized records means more and more, although the the caution, there's two cautions with digitized records. One is when you can just type it in, but I find a lot of errors on 
the big um, genealogical sites. You can look, they have family trees, and you're like, oh, that actually, that, no, that's different Susan Brown. Put that Susan, that Susan Brown is not your Susan Brown. That's this Susan Brown, right? Even a name like Eliza Price, it's not the most common name in the world, but there are going to be more than one Eliza Price. Um, and the other piece of that, and actually this is something I learned, I uh, put up Sweet Taste of Liberty, Caleb McDaniel's book. In the epilogue to that book, he talks about his research, and one of the things he mentions is that a lot of the digitization that has been happening of those records is being done by people who are in prison. And it's a weird thing about prison labor because you don't have to pay people in prison the same rate that you do other people to work. And I think some of them are volunteering in prison to do that, which you could read as showing that they care about things and that they're learning computer skills that they can use when they leave prison. Or it could be that if you do this work for free, that then the company that puts those sites together is, makes it benefits them. They write you a nice letter when you come up for parole, and it helps you make parole. So if, as somebody who writes about the exploitation of labor, every time I enter into one of those searches, I get a little like, whoa, what do we need to think about the exploitation of labor? I warned you at the beginning that I think about history all the time. You were warned. Um, that was a long answer to your very brief question. There was, yeah. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> Somebody else. We've got like two minutes. Come on. All right. Thank you so much. Just a couple uh, coda to, uh, to, to give you as we leave. Speaking of digitized records, don't forget the library has a site called Virginia Untold, which has many thousands of digitized uh, records related to African Americans, uh, and we in fact are going to be expanding that significantly. We just took a fairly large collection of the so-called free Negro registers up to uh, one of our vendors, and those will be digitized, so we continue to add to that collection. Um, also, if you could, we're always interested in your feedback about our talks, so um, on the table outside, you can pick up a, a form or you can give us your thoughts on the program today. And also, don't forget, we'll have upcoming in the next couple of weeks, I think um, several other of our fellows will be speaking about their projects as well. So stay tuned for programming as we go forward. Anyways, thank you very much for coming out.